This video is dedicated to R.J. Michael, Sam Dicker, Dale Look, and all of the members of the Amiga System Software team. Hi, I'm Tom Terriams with another video in the Amiga as a Workstation series. I wanted to take and make a particular program that would beep at me whenever I would take and finish a very long compile. Except, I'm not just on any computer here, I'm on an Amiga and I can make the beeper sound like whatever I want. So I'm gonna make it sound like an orchestra hit. Well, doing that is actually very easy. Turns out, there's a whole set of, uh, there's a whole set of system calls, and there's the audio device inside of the Kickstart, which provides a nice abstracted interface to the entire audio device. But first, let's just go ahead and run the program here for those who are impatient. Yeah, you can see it works. So I can take and do, I can do, a, I can do an execute make. And then as it's typing there, I can type in orch and whenever it's done, it'll take and just blast that orchestra head out at me. So, how does it work? Well, let's take a look at it. The first thing I'll show here, if we go into the workspace folder, we'll look at the data for the orchestra hit sound itself. This particular data is the entire sound, just encoded as a nice little uh, C array here. It happens to be in what's called 8-bit signed format and you can take a look and see the original sound right here in audacity which was pulled from a Fairlight CMI series 2 and you can see the file here and if we take and export that audio what we wound up doing was lowering the sample rate a little bit to 11,025 Hertz or why not I could have lowered it further and gotten a bit more space out of it sure and it needs to be signed 8-bit PCM. So for that, hold on a minute here. Ah, it's because I need to use other, other uncompressed formats here. So raw, headerless, signed, 8-bit PCM at 11,025. You take and save that, run that through a tool like XXD, and you've got your data. Now, where does this data need to go? To understand that, we need to think, talk a little bit about the Amiga memory architecture, ever so slightly. The Amiga has three custom chips that are inside the system. You have the uh, Agnes, which coordinates all of the direct memory access throughout the system and provides the copper, provides, uh, pr provides the blitter, does all the memory-related functions and all the DMA-related functions. You've got Denise, which is outputting this display that we're seeing right here. And you've got Paula. And Paula is the sound chip that we're going to be using to output our sound. And it can accept 8-bit sound. And each of these particular chips has their own set of DMA channels that go to it. In the case of Paula, it's got DMA channels for not only for the four sound channels that it provides. I mean, it has four channel sound channels arranged in stereo, by the way. One and four on the left, two and three on the right. Uh, it also help controls the floppy and everything else. And all of that's handled through DMA. The caveat is that only the memory that, is, that can be accessed through Agnes can be used through DMA. And that memory is called chip memory because it is memory that is available to be used by the custom chips. And on the Amiga 1000, that is a maximum of 512K of chip RAM. Again, due to the size of its Agnes. So, one of the things that the Amiga developers had to do is they had to, in addition to indicating that you could dynamically allocate memory from both uh, chip memory or fast memory or even public memory, which is, I don't care where this comes from, 
they needed a way to specify where each segment actually comes from. And for that, they needed a tool called Atom. And what's happening here is I wrote a custom little make, uh, custom little make script right here, which takes and compiles our source code. And every, 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 if everything is okay, it builds the second pass with the quads outputted from the first pass of the compiler. The dash V basically says we don't want any stack checking here. Uh, we then take and run the resulting object file through Atom. And we specify as part of Atom's parameters where things like the program code needs to go. Uh, so code needs to go into public memory, which means we don't care where it goes. And we want the chip memory to hold our data and BSS. We do this so that literally the unsigned data that we have right here will go into the correct place. Now with that out of the way, let's actually take and look at the program code itself so we can see how this actually works. Move this out of the way, go into the workspace, go back into Orch here, and we will open up Orch.c. So you've seen Orch.h, which is the sound file and the make file, which does the necessary call to Atom to pull it in. This is all that you need to output a particular sound out through the sound channel. We have the usual uh, suspects as far as including uh, exec because we need types and uh, memory structures here. We're going to be talking to the heart to the custom chips in the hardware, so we need hardware custom, hardware DMA bits. Uh, we have libraries DOS H here. Uh, may not actually need that. We can probably actually get rid of that. And we have devices audio dot H, which contains the custom I/O structures that are required to communicate with the audio device. And of course, we have our orch.h. A very useful bit of literature here to deal with the audio device is chapter five of the Amiga ROM kernel reference manual, libraries and devices. This is the audio device chapter. And it goes through the whole process of dealing with the audio device. And it talks a bit about how the audio device works conceptually here, as well as giving you a handful of bits of references to uh, different publications that were uh, really useful at the time for understanding how digital music actually works, and especially in regards to synthesizing your own waveforms. Of course, we've got some we've got some individual definitions and whatnot that we'll be using throughout all of this that are also defined here. Now, audio is actually implemented as a device. That means, like there you have a serial device, like you have a parallel device, printer device, etc. You also have an audio device. And like all of the other devices in the system, it can accept I.O. requests. And these are literally packets of information containing everything needed for the audio device to do its work. And you have commands that co uh, correspond a lot to other devices, such as read and write, but you've got special commands like wait cycle and allocate and reset, others like that. The first thing that it literally talks about here is this concept of allocation and arbitration. And this is one of the very thoughtful things about the system libraries that are inside the Kickstart. And that's that just like every other library inside the Kickstart and every other device inside the Kickstart, audio device was designed to be used in a multitasking environment, not just in the context of Workbench running multiple applications that could potentially be spitting sound at you, but even in the context of something like a game where you would have different characters inside the game, each running different tasks and, call, and, and spawning tasks to make sounds and doing all of this asynchronously. 
These tasks may need to call on sound and may not have access to the chat sound channels that they want. So a whole precedent system was literally created here, which is a lot like task priorities, where you can basically say, okay, um, I want my sound to happen at any cost, no matter what's happening, to if something's already happening and I have no other way to allocate it, then just ignore it and everything in between. And it gives you some suggestions as to how to use these precedent, not precedence numbers, giving them annotations here. Now, it then basically says, just like we're dealing with any particular audio, like dealing with any other device, you have to take and open that device. You have to take and fill in the message structures for the things that you're going to send down that device. You also need a reply port so that you can get your messages back whenever the device is through and says, okay, I'm, I'm done. That's just part and parcel with exec in general. But you also have the ability to take and do begin IO, abort IO, etc. Do IO doesn't work with uh, sound devices as well as you might think. It actually pays to deal with sound asynchronously. It tends to work a lot better. But you have a number of different commands that are very unique to dealing with the audio device. You have the ability to take and say, okay, I need to play a sound. Can you give me a set of sound channels? These are the sound channels I prefer. These are the allocation. And then when you're done, you have a free. This is called, ironically, whenever you take and close the device as well. But I can also take at any given time and reset the precedence for a particular sound. Let's say, for example, that I'm in the middle of playing a sound and I played the important part of the sound, which must be heard, then I can take and reset the priorities in the middle of playing that sound to a lower priority. So if something else needs to play over me, it can. Yes, you can get that finely grained control. And finally, if you want direct access to the registers themselves, you have the ability to take and lock a particular set of sound channels, and then through accessing the device fields, get direct access to those registers for the, for the, for the channels that it allocated to you without explicitly having to take and hard code those registers in your code. In fact, one of the examples that's actually in this particular chapter goes over doing that. You also have the usual suspects. You have the ability to take and write to the device, which is how you place down in the first place. Wait for things to finish. Uh, change the performance volumes. Uh, and period and and period uh, cycle times, which is basically pitch, uh, flush things out, reset the device. You have the ability to send an audio command that says, "Okay, I want to uh, suspend I/O access to this until the next cycle of what I'm trying to send out, so that I can potentially take and synchronize it for things like double buffering and the like." Again, the thing that really comes across when dealing with all of this is just how unbelievably, unbelievably well thought out these individual devices and libraries really were. They were trying to make something that could actually be used in a situation where a game would be made up of tons and tons of different tasks, potentially firing off different things to play sounds, move graphics, and to do all of these things smoothly and effectively without collision. Again, we have allocate. And that brings us back to our code here. First thing that we really need to do is we need to figure out what we're going to actually take and allocate here. Now, let's say, for example, that we want to allocate a particular set of stereo channels. We really don't care which stereo channels we get as long as we get a stereo pair. And so all we really need to do here is specify Okay, these are the, it's a bit mask. So we say, okay, we get three, which is channels zero and one, or we can get channels uh, zero and two, 
or we can get channels one and three, or we can get channels two and three. In any case, we have four possibilities that we can take and loop through to say, okay, uh, these are the four possibilities that we want to try to allocate for our sound channels. And all we really have to do for that, if we look at it from main, let's just go to main here, and I'll quickly go over main. Main is simple. We do initialize for our sound device. If we can't, we're done. Otherwise, we try to play the sound. Then we're done. Return zero. So what's in an it? Let's have a look. And the first thing that we do is we keep track of whether or not we've opened the device or not. And this will come in handy when we take and clean up so that we can close the device if we need to. Okay, we set that up. There are other ways we can take care of this too. For example, if we want direct hardware control, we can get access to the device structure and keep a copy of that. And if that pointer is set, then we know the device is open. Yeah. A, few, a few different ways we can slay that dragon. So we need to create our reply port because we're sending, we're sending off messages. Specifically, we're sending off IO requests. We need a way for uh, replies to come back indicating that these things have completed. So we create our port. We're not going to give the port a name or anything, so we just pass in null, and you know, the other parameter just ha will happen also to be zero here. So, okay, great. If we don't have a port, then we, bop, then we bail. Then we need to take and build the message that we're going to use as the foundation for our audio requests. And this is an audio I.O. block. And this is actually defined. If you take a look in devices audio, include devices audio. You'll see a whole bunch, you'll see all of the enumerations for the different commands, default values, the flags and things that need to be set, but we have right here our IO audio block structure. And it's built like an IO request. In fact, that literally contains, like every other uh, IO, IO structure inside the system, we start off with a structure of an IO request, and then we add to it. In this case, we have an allocation key, which is what gets stored whenever we take and do an allocation request. Uh, when we do an allocation command, we get back this allocation key, and we can put this allocation key into any message that we send back to ensure that we use the, I the audio channels that we ask for. Of course, we have a pointer to our data that we're going to deal with. That's pretty generic, and we have a link for that data. But we also have three audio specific. Uh, we also have three audio specific uh, uh, parameters here, and the first is period, which corresponds to frequency or pitch, uh, volume or amplitude, and uh, cycles. And cycles indicates how many times this I/O request should be performed. For example, in the t in the case of a write request. So we take and create this I.O. block using create ext I.O. because this is a, an extended I.O. request here, and we need to preserve what is happening with the I.O. with the uh, I.O. audio structure. If we don't get it, we bail. Then we go ahead and immediately as part of our initial open, we go ahead and set up an I.O. block to say, OK, this audio I.O. block exists at priority. Well, what's priority? Remember, priority is what was mentioned back here. It gives us our precedence. We set that right here. We go ahead and get that out of the way. And we go ahead as part of this whole thing, we feed it the allocation map that we've defined up above. Then we take and of course the size of if we go ahead and pass in length and data as part of our initial IOB when we do our open device, then it goes ahead and does the allocation for us and passes it back. It makes it that much simpler. Again, some, some thoughtfulness here. 
Okay, we're good. Device is opened. If 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 it fails, okay, return false. Device isn't open. Otherwise, device is opened, and we're done initializing. All of the initialization has been done. We now have access to the audio device. Audio name is a constant inside of devices audio here. If you if you if you dig down even further in here, you may have seen it scroll by. It's just the string audio dot device. Anyway, so now we finally do the orch sound. I do a little bit of defensive programming here. Sure, why not? It doesn't take that long. If our device isn't open, then we bail. This is just so that we don't crash. Since we don't have any memory protection, it, it, it's a good idea to do stuff like this. Um, so we then take and set up our I.O. block to write to the audio device. And all we really have to do, again, is create a command, is do a command write. And that command write has some I.O. flags that get set as well. So if you look at uh, ADIO, ADIOF verbal, what that basically means is to set the period and the volume as part of our message here. We wanna go ahead and change those things as part of our IO request. Otherwise, if we don't do this, these two, the, these two fields will be ignored and it will use uh, whatever is whatever was previously set. In this case, those will be zero. You wouldn't hear anything. Let me come back. Let me see if I can come, let me see if I can come back to this. Come on, go away. Let's see if I can find previous expansion. Come on. I have a funny feeling I'm trying to take and show this in the manual here and my system is just, yeah, my PDF viewer is acting funny. To hell with it. The point being is that there is a flag that basically says we need to set the period and volume. Great. And then as part of cycles, you saw cycles in the structure before, we only want to play the, the waveform once. If we wanted to play it twice or three times, we could reset that value here. Finally, all we have to do is just do it. We do a begin I.O. And then uh, because this is asynchronous and there is nothing else that will happen, uh, it will literally take, if I didn't have this wait I.O. right here, then it would fall through, return to true, and immediately start doing done, which would immediately close the device, which would flush out uh, all of the requests stop the audio and you wouldn't hear anything. It would happen too fast. So with that, all we have to do, begin IO, we wait for that IO to complete and then we return true. Finally, when we're done, it's just clean up. If the device is open, we close it. If we have our audio IOB defined, we go ahead and delete it. We get it, we, we get it done. And in point of fact, uh, we probably actually should. I know it's a little boo-boo here. We're allocating memory for it, so we should do this. My bad. Hold on. I need to see what that's what that size of that structure is. Give me just a second. Did I actually do it? Oh, ah, okay, never mind. It already does that as part of that, so never mind. Okay, <laughs> that's cool. Whatever. We delete the external I/O and we're done. Then we take, and if we have our port, we delete our port. Then we return true. And down to our main. And that's all we have to do to take and, uh, to take and actually get this to work. So, let's come back all the way back here. And I made a special version of Orch here. Uh, you saw the make. 
And the make basically had as part of its build process, we build the first pass, then we build the second pass, making sure that we have stack checking. But we run it through Atom so that the data that gets output from Orch Age gets put into chip memory. It gets put into chip memory as well as the BSS. This is important for it to work. If we don't do this, I built a version of Orch that doesn't have Atom built, but that wasn't atomized. Watch what happens. See? The data is in public memory somewhere. Agnes can't get to it. It wraps around on the address counter and you get garbage. And luckily we didn't crash. So, but if I run the version that's properly, let's go ahead and just build it again and use it as intended. Execute make. And then while that's running, I'll go ahead and just fire off Orch here and we'll build it. Again, I hope you guys are enjoying this particular series of videos. If there's anything that I uh, should cover, please let me know in the comments. Uh, if you haven't subscribed already, please go ahead and subscribe. I would very much appreciate it. It would be nice at some point to get a tiny bit of advertising revenue from these. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe not. A guy could dream, I guess. Hmm. One thing to note while this is building is the period size. And that's one thing I didn't cover here explicitly. We'll go ahead and cover it here while this is compiling. What is period size and how do you determine it? Well, period size actually comes from, well, you heard, you heard Orge go there anyway. <laughs> and I caused a typo. So we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and, and uh, go back in and fix that real quick. But you heard it go. Uh, it, audio nay. I, I deliberately... I deliberately caused a typo. And I know that there were probably some of you at the screen screaming going, Oh no, he caused a typo. I'm sorry. It happens. We'll go ahead and we'll execute make and then we'll run Orch again. And while that's happening, Recall that the sample rate for this particular file was being exported out at 11,025, okay? And we're exporting it out as a raw file that's signed 8-bit PCM because that's what Paula wants for its sample format. Well, um, in order to get the period value, you don't put in the sample rate. You'll recall that the sample rate was not part of the was not part of the period value it field. It was a value like 325, right? Well, to get that value, I needed to divide the sample rate of my sample, which is the number of uh, which is the number of individual samples that are played at each second by the system clock value which if anybody if any of you is familiar with ntsc video this number will look a bit familiar to you you might chuckle a little bit but yeah that's the ntsc color burst frequency the amiga runs at that frequency which is the reason why it's so goddamn good at video in the first place so uh you need to divide the uh, system clock rate by your sample rate. And that will give you your period value. Now you'll notice that your period value is here at 3.24.67, da 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 da. You need to then use the next integer value. So you'll see if we actually take a look. Here. And we look for period. 
see period size. I, would, I actually was doing the right thing here and, and using it as a constant. And you'll see our period size is 324. Uh, 324 is close enough. It could be 324 or 325. And if we actually take and do 325, what we get is a sample rate actually close to 11,013 hertz, which is close enough. It gives us the right pitch. So we should be done by now. Once this link finishes, we should, it should alert us here, we're sleeping. Now I've been coding for eight straight days, 915 hours a week. I'm feeling very tired. And the music's not working anymore. Damn it, I can't stay awake. I'm going to play my head down. Okay. It's good. Just a second. <laughs> What? Oh, God. There. Hey. Oh, good. We're done. So, with that, uh, that, that ends our video here. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I hope uh, RJ and team also enjoyed that as well. This was definitely one hell of a callback. But, uh, anyway, uh, until next time, guys. Have fun. <laughs>